In this tutorial, we're going to go over chemical kinetics practice questions. Just before we get to answer the questions that we have, let's get to review chemical kinetics. So basically, what is chemical kinetics? So when we talk about chemical kinetics, we are basically getting to study the rate of a chemical reaction. So how fast or how slow a chemical reaction progresses. So if you've been given reactants A plus B, in a chemical reaction giving us C plus D and of course in a case where we have got stoichiometric coefficients you need to understand that the rate of a chemical reaction can either be given in terms of uh, the reactants or the products in terms of the reactants we get to put a negative then we'll say the change in concentration for example in this case I can talk about A over the change in time so of course multiplied by 1 over the stoichiometric coefficient A. That is also equivalent to negative 1 over B multiplied by the change in concentration of B over change in time. Then as you get to talk about um, the products, basically it's just positive. Okay, well, so why is it positive? Because we expect as the reaction progresses, we expect the amounts of the products to increase with time. That's why we need to expect that every time you are asked to determine the rate, it's basically going to be what? A positive value. Because when you're saying um, for a reactant, let's start study that we had a concentration of two molar concentration. Then um, after maybe, let's say, a period of 10 seconds, after 10 seconds, you find that the concentration reduces to 0 0.5 molar concentration. So you're determining the rate of um, that equation. Of course, assuming maybe let's say it was 2A plus B. In terms of our A, our formula of, of the rate is going to be negative 1 over 2, which is a stoichiometric coefficient, multiplied by the change in concentration. The final one was what? 0 0.5. Initially, we had 2 over the change in time, which is a 10. So that is how you get to go about your calculations, where you're saying 0 0.5 minus 2, is going to be negative 1.5 multiplied by 1 over 2 divided by 10. So in this case, our solution is 0 0.075 molar per second. So these are the units that we get to work with when you're talking about the rate. Remember, for our concentration, it is molar. Then for our time, it is second. So the units are molar per second. Okay, so <coughs> apart from that, under chemical kinetics, we also need to understand some of the factors that get to affect um, the rate of a chemical reaction. So, of course, we did talk about, um, we've talked about some factors that depend on two theories. The first theory that they depend on is referred to as the collision theory. So, when you're trying to understand how the factors get to affect uh, the rates of chemical reactions, we need to understand that they are dependent on the collision theory. So, this one tells us to say that for a chemical reaction to progress, or for chemical reaction to take place, what needs to happen is what? What? Particles must what? Particles must collide. So in every in every reaction, particles must collide with sufficient energy. So particles must collide. Not only should they collide, but they should collide with what? With sufficient energy. Okay. So. When you're trying to look at uh, the, um, the factors that are going to increase the rate of a chemical reaction, you're trying to look at how positively are they going to enforce or lead to collisions. So, for example, when you talk about the increase in temperature, when you increase the temperature of um, reactants, do you expect to increase the number of collisions or not? So, the more you increase the temperature, because we also understand that... Uh, this is going to be dependent on kinetic theory. So, you increasing the temperature will lead to an increase in kinetic energy of the particles, meaning that particles will be able to move more freely, and they will actually eventually get to collide more, leading to an increase in the rate of uh, the reaction. So, even as you get to talk about the concentration as well, you need to understand that when you increase the concentration of the reactants, the, the probability of the particles colliding is going to be more. So an increase in concentration also leads to an increase in what? Would lead to an increase in the rate of a chemical reaction. 
Talking about gaseous products, an increase in pressure, if you increase the pressure, of course we do understand that pressure is in this proportion to the volume. So the moment you increase the pressure, the volume is supposed to be reduced. And if you reduce the volume of a container, you expect that in a smaller container, with the same number of particles or with the same concentration, there are going to be more collisions in the smaller container. So increasing the pressure will also increase the rate of a chemical reaction. Then uh, the other thing that we need to understand for the solid particles is the surface area. When you increase the surface area, you favor more what? More collisions. So an increase in the surface area will increase what? The rates of a chemical reaction. So those are some of the factors that we did talk about. Then one more thing that is very important is um, <coughs> the formulas that we get to work with. So we call them the integrated retros. So these apply to orders of reactions. So basically, what are these integrated laterals? So we need to understand that we will basically we have what we call first zero order reactions. So for a zero order reaction, the equation that we get to work with is basically the final concentration being equal to negative KT plus the initial concentration. So on the graph, when you're trying to come up with a graph for a first order reaction, or when you get to put the concentration against the time, so for a zero order, your graph is plotted, uh, it's basically your time against the concentration of the particles, okay, of any particle, of any reactant. So when you get to plot your graph, concentration against time, if you look at our K there, it is negative. So in this case, the gradient is negative. So if it comes out to be a straight line like this, that is basically, it, it is proof enough that it's a zero order reaction, all right? Then the other thing that we also need to understand is eh, when you're trying to determine the, let me proceed to the first order. So when you talk about the first order on the other parts, the first order is basically going to be focused on the graph of time against the natural log of what? The natural log of the concentration. So that's the only difference there. So what happens is, eh, we are going to introduce the natural log to every part of the equation that add the concentration, okay? But the, the gradient remains the same, meaning that if you put the natural log against the, the concentration, if the graph comes out this way, it is also what? It is the first order reaction. Then for the second order reaction, <coughs> instead of it just being with the natural log, or it doesn't even have the natural log, so for the second order, what we basically have is the idea of um, it's basically one it becomes a reciprocal of the concentrations, okay? And here the gradient is a positive, so this one basically tends to face upwards, okay? It goes this way when you plot it, when you sketch it. So it's very, very important in a case where they ask you to sketch, you need to understand that you try out different graphs. For the zero order, you try out the concentration just as it is given against the time. For the first order, you try out against the natural log of the concentrations. Then for the second order, just against the reciprocal of the given concentrations. So if it comes out to be a positive gradient, then you are clearly assured that what you have is what? Is a second order reaction. So now, let's get to define what we have in this case. So the first question says, what is or basically define the reaction rate. So when you're talking about the reaction rate, you're trying to look at how fast a chemical reaction progresses. Or you can define it in terms of um, in terms of the reactants, where you can say that uh, the reaction rate is basically the rate of change of uh, the concentrations of the reactants in respect to time or per unit time. So now, that is generally speaking when you're talking about the reaction rate. So we also need to understand what the initial rate is, what the average rate is, and also what the instantaneous rate is. So I'll start with the instantaneous rate of um, a chemical reaction. So when you talk about the instantaneous rate of a chemical reaction, what you get to talk about is basically the reaction rate at any point the reaction rate at any point 
in a chemical reaction. So the reaction rate at any point in the chemical reaction is what we call the instantaneous rate. It, it may be at start, it may be after 10 seconds from the starting point, or even at the end. So that is what we call the instantaneous rate of a chemical reaction. So now, <laughs> thinking about this, we can move to what we call the initial rate. So the initial rate is basically the instantaneous rate at start. Okay, or the rate of a chemical reaction just as you get to start. Initially, as you start. So the initial rate is instantaneous rate at start of a chemical reaction. Then the average rate of a chemical reaction, on the other hand, is just going to be the rate of chemical reaction for a given period of time or for a range. Okay, here you talk about the <coughs> you're given the range or a period of time. For example, you say from 10 to 20 seconds. So you get to look at the concentrations at 10 seconds and at 20 seconds. So the rate of change of a chemical reaction between a range or within a range or within a period of time, that basically gets to tell you that that is the average rate of a chemical reaction. And that is how these are different. Question two. A first order reaction is 58.5% complete in 480 seconds. Calculate the value of the rate constant. What is the value of the half life? How long will it take for the reaction to reach 95% completion? So, basically, what we said is um, for a first order reaction, the equation is the natural log of what? The final concentration equal to minus kt plus the natural log of what? The natural log of uh, the initial concentration in a chemical reaction. So we've been taught that I fit 8.5% complete. So at the start of the experiment, what you have is uh, 100%. So that is your initial concentration. So now, after 480 seconds, it's fit 8.5% done. Meaning that from the 100 that you had, 38.5 has been used. So you subtract the 38.5 the from the 100. And basically, if you get to subtract, so what you're going to have is uh, 61.5. So at final, after 38.5% is done, what you're going to remain with is um, the final concentration of what? 61. what? 61.5%. So we have our final and our initial concentration. So now the question is, what can calculate the value of the rate constant? So it's just a matter of now plugging into the equation there. Okay. So we have the natural log, the final concentration there. What we have is 61.5. So if I take the other on the other side, it will be a minus natural log. The initial, we had 100. Equal to? minus k. Our time is 480. I've just substituted in the given equation there. So from our logs, we also told subtracting logs with the same base is the same as you get the or you maintain the log, then you get to divide what is attached to the log. So this is the same as the natural log of 61.5 divided by 100 being equal to minus k multiplied by what? 480. So 1.5 divided by 100 is basically 0 0.615. So you have the natural log of 0 0.615 divided by, I can divide by minus 480. So at the other side, I can just remain with k. So I've taken away the negative together with the 480 and divided, the divided it the other side. So natural log of that divided by negative 480. So the result I'm getting for my k is 0 0.0010127. So that is our value for our k. So our final solution that we're going to present in relation to the given data where is going to be k is equal to 0 0.00101. So that is our value of k. But B says, 
what is the value of the half-life. So remember, just before we get to present our value of k, we need to understand that every time you've been given the first order reaction, the units for k is S negative. Okay. So in a case where you've forgotten or you don't know how to determine it, I would advise you go by the retro. So when they tell you <coughs> when they tell you for to find the, the units for the constant scale, what you need to look at is uh, the basic concept on the retro. So I can come up with a retro on the first order reaction meaning that it's only going to be dependent on a single reaction raised to the power one okay so like that for example so we need to understand that for the rate it's basically molar per second then for our constant scale we don't know for our concentration of the reactant it's molar so if you get to divide by the molar both sides it's going to cancel out and what you're going to have is that your k is going to be one per second which is just second negative that is how you get to get the units. So if it was a second order, if it was a second order, it would just be what? To the power two. And you, add, you would have molar per second, k, then your concentration would be squared, so it would be molar squared. So you divide by molar squared both sides, molar squared. So the molar would cancel out with one, you remain with one single one there. Your k is going to be one over molar multiplied by second. So these are the units for second order constant, or it may be that if you take them on top or to the numerator. Now, let's get to determine the value of the half-life. So we need to understand the formula for the half-life, which is basically determined from the integrated retro. So to just show you how we come about it, how it comes about, if you look at the first um, order integrated retro. It's a natural log of the final concentration equal to minus k2 plus the natural log of um, the initial concentration. So now your final concentration is like the half-life is like trying to ask you how long it takes for the initial concentration to be reduced to its half. So assuming initially our final or our initial concentration was a 2 or maybe or a one, whichever works, any of the two can work. So if your initial concentration is a one, your half-life is basically the time it's going to take for that one to become what? To become 0 0.5, meaning that it has reduced to its half. So if you get to substitute in the equation, your final is what? 0 0.5. Minus k2 plus natural log of what? 1. So then, remember we said from the natural logs or from the logarithm, from our logarithms we are told whenever you have um, a subtraction, so we can have subtraction of 0 0.5 minus the natural log of 1 being equal to minus k2. Remember the time that we are talking about here is the time it's going to take to reduce to its half. So we can just put it to be half there. At that point, these are same logs, so we can maintain the log, and then we get to do what? We get to divide 0 0.5 divided by what? 1. So from there, what do we have? We have equal to negative k t 1 over 2. Okay, so what we have now is 0 0.5 divided by 1, which is uh, just like 1 over 2, or oh, natural log of what? 1 over 2 being equal to negative what? Negative k t 1 over 2. Okay, so now at this point, we also know that 1 over 2 is the same as what? is the same as 2 to the power negative 1, which is equal to negative kt, which is our half-life. So our goal is to make the half-life to be the subject. What do we get to have? So logarithms tell us that that can become 
can be dropped this side. So what do we have? The natural log of 2 equal to negative k t 1 over 2. So the negatives would go and you remain with what? You remain with the positive. So your half-life is therefore equivalent to the natural log of 2 over what? Over your k. So this is our formula that works for the half-life, for the first order. So equally, this applies to all the other orders of reactions that you may have. It's just a matter of you working with what you, you have to be use it and determine the, the half-life formula. So now that we have our equation, now that we have our equation, we can now try to this simplify it. Natural log of 2 divided by our constant 0 0.0101. What are we going to have? So natural log of 2 divided by 0 0.00101. So after doing your calculations there, after you've divided, I'm getting 686.28 seconds. So remember for half-life, you're talking, talking about the time. So the units are going to be what? The units are going to be seconds. Uh. So you can just say 686 seconds because in the question we are given three significant figures. So that's what we have as our solution. Then. Um, the question also continues to say, how long will it take for the reaction to reach 95% completion? So 95% completion. So if you had started with 100%, then for it to for it to be 95% done, you need to subtract the 95 from the 100 for you to be able to get your final concentration. So therefore, your final is going to be what? 5%. So you can go back to our equation. The natural log of the final concentration, which in this case is a 5, is equal to minus k. Our k in this case is what? Is 0 0.00101 multiplied by the t, t, which is what we're trying to find, plus the natural log of the initial at start, which is 100. So we have the natural log of 5 over 100 from the logs, then equal to negative 0 0.00101 t. So 5 divided by 100 is 0 0.05. Okay. So we have the, the natural log of 0 0.005. So by the way, by the way, if you want, there's no need of you just trying to do what I've done. Or what you can do is just take this one and just subtract. Just say, punch it on the calculator as it is, as you have it. Natural log of 5 minus the natural log of 100. You're still going to have the same solution. So I was just trying to simplify it using the logs. So there's no harm doing that. So natural log of 0 0.005 is equivalent to negative 0 0.00101. Then, uh, so natural log of that divided by negative 0 .00, 0 0.0001. And what I have is a 2,966.07 seconds. So looking at the three significant figures, this solution can even be 297.0 seconds. So that is still fine. And that's how you get to answer these questions. The third part of the question says, given the reaction rate data for that, determine the order of each reactant and the other reaction order. So this is a very good question which will help us understand how to determine the orders of reactions and also be able to come up with a retrom when you're given such information. So it's like if we are doing two, three trials, three different experiments on the, on the same reactants with different concentrations. So for example, if I talk about in the test experiment, we had that concentration of 
the fluorides, that concentration for the other reactants, and that was the rate. Again, you tried it out, you maintained the concentration for the fluoride, then changed the concentration for the other reactant. Then the rate changed. But in the other case, you tried to do the same. You changed the concentration for the fluoride and maintained the concentration as in the first experiment for the other reactant. Again, what did you observe? Again, you observed that even the rate was what? Changed. So when you get to do such, you're trying to understand, to see whether if you get to change the concentration of I, any of the reactants, does it have an effect on the rate? So we've seen in this case that in both cases, after maintaining any, after maintaining any of um, the reactants concentration there, the rate was changing just after changing the concentration of any of the two. So therefore, we can predict that all these reactants have got an effect on the rate of a chemical reaction. So now we need to determine to what term or what effect they do have by looking at the order. The way we get to do that is you write the retro. So your rate is basically going to be dependent on K, which is a constant, multiplied by the concentration so of the reactants that you have. And these are going to be raised to different powers. I'll say M and what? N. So A and B are just representing the different reactants that you may have. So let's try to apply what we have. Okay. So in this case, for our rate, for our reactant, we have fluorides too. So raise the power M. And you can also put the other reactant there. Raise the power N. So now, we need to find the values of M and N. So that requires us to come up with two different equations. So it is very advisable of course, in this case, it's very simple because you have a case where any of the reactants is what? Is constant. But in a case where only one is constant at one point, you are advised to start with such an experiment. Okay. Let's try to do that. So we've been taught, if you check experiment one and experiment two, for the fluoride, the concentration is maintained, so that's what we're going to use. Okay, let's try to maintain the concentration there. So we're going to say, therefore, our rate for, I'll start with the first one. Our rate for the first one is 1.2 times 10 to the power negative 3 equal to K. So remember we are saying our rate is equal to K dependent on the concentrations that we have. That's the power M and N, respectively. For our rate, initially we are that, so I've substituted. For our K, we don't know. For our A, which is the fluoride, we are 0 0.1. Then for the other reactant, so of course that's the power M. Then for the other reactant, we had um, 0 0.01. That's the power N. So we can now divide by the other one. For the other one, we had what? For the rate, we had 4.8 times 10 to the power negative 3. Then uh, K. Then we had 0 0.1. So we are maintaining now the here the concentration was maintained. Then for the other one, we had 0 0.04 power N. So the basic idea of um, us getting the same concentrations is to for them to divide out or cancel out. So I was just trying to show because this may be your first time you are meeting such a question. But in a case where you've done it for several times, no need of you showing the K, no need of you showing the one that is maintained because you'll just divide and it'll give you a 1. Okay. So at the end of the day, what you're going to have is uh, just the left hand side dividing. So what you're going to have is uh, if you divide what is on the left there, uh, you have 1 over 4 equal to the other side they're going to remain with also 1 over 4 
0 0.01 divided by 0 0.04 is 1 over 4. So what you have is like, this is supposed to be raised to the power n. Okay. So since they are one and the same on both sides, n is therefore equivalent to what? To 1. So you get to work with indices. And usually it's basically advisable to divide the smaller values into the bigger ones so that you don't get confused with the reciprocals. So what would have done would have just said, okay, since we've maintained the concentrations, since the concentrations are the same in the first and the second experiment for the fluoride, we're going to focus our attention on the rates. So divide the second rate, which is 4.8, by 10 to the power negative 3, divided by 1.2. This is ultimately supposed to be equivalent to. So again, since we started with the second one, 4.8, we need to start with that. 0 0.04. Of course, we do understand that raised to the power n over, again, 0 0.01 raised to the power n. So, on the left hand side, we still have a 4 equal to 4 to the power n, which was still going to give us what? <laughs> a 1. So, we found our value of n to be 1. And remember for our, our rate in this case, we are saying it's k. Then we have fluoride 2, which is the power m then for the other reactants. We found the value to be a 1. Let's try to find the value of m. So now at this point, looking at our rate formula that we've come up with, k is that, then we have fluoride 2 to the power m, then chloride O2 to the power 1. So now, <coughs> excuse me, at this point what you can do is uh, basically just get to substitute and plug in. Okay, so in this case, it's very, very easy to do away with because what we have is uh, we've been given the what? We've been given a case where even the other reactant is maintained. So we're going to work with the fade and what? The fade and the first one. So which one is having bigger values? It's the third one. So we'll divide the third one. 2.4 by 10 to the power negative 3. Divided by the first one, which was 1.2. Equal to. Then um, the ones that are maintained, this one is maintained. So it's going to cancel out. We're going to focus our attention on the one that is changing. So 0 0.2 from the third divided by 0 0.10. So of course we do understand that we are raising this to the power m. So if you get to divide on the left, 2.4 divided by 1.2 is going to be a 2. 0 0.2 divided by 0 0.1 is going to be a 2 to the power m. So what would be the value of m there? Since the bases are the same, our value of m is therefore equivalent to what? It's equivalent to 1. So we found that for both m and n, they're all equivalent to 1. So therefore... The order in respect to each reactant was 1. So the order in respect to the fluoride is 1. To that one is also a 1. Now the overall order of a reaction, what you need to understand is uh, it basically gets to focus on the attention or basically it's basically the result of the summation of what? The reactants that you have. They are orders. So in this case we have 1 and a 1. So the overall order of the reaction is therefore what? Is the summation of the individual orders. So therefore the overall order of the reaction is a 2. And for the question that is asking us to determine the retro, the retro is what I've written there. The retro basically just looks at the formula of the rates, k in respect to k and the orders of the reactants. It's just an equation. So now this equation which we're calling the retro is basically the equation that you get to work with to find what we are now calling what? The rate constant. So what is this rate constant? So the rate constant that we're talking about is basically the um, is basically the same what? The same value of k. That's what you're talking about. And how do you get to go about it? So the way you get to approach that kind of a question is um, by just looking at any experiment of your choice and trying to simplify things. So in this case, I'll just go for the second experiment. So I know what is I have on my left is the rate. 
I can now substitute 10. So my rate is 4.8 by 10 to the power negative 3. I don't know my value of k. I'll write just write k. My fluoride concentration in the second experiment is 0 0.1. So I'll put it just the power 1. For the other reactant, it's 0 0.04. So 0 0.1 multiplied by 0 0.04. It's 0 0.004. So 0 0.004, that will cancel out, then divide the other side as well. So remember we have 4.8 by 10 to the power negative 3. We need to divide by 0 0.04. So what I'm getting is 1.2. I'm getting a 1.2. So what are the units? What are the units for a second order? So I just determined that it's basically m negative 1, s negative 1. We determined that in our previous question. So we've answered this question. Moving on to the fourth question. Consider the table of initial rate for the reaction between hemoglobin and carbon monoxide. The experiments are three. Now, if you look at this data, it's a bit unique and a bit different from what we had. Because if you check in the first experiment and the second, at least we do have a point where carbon monoxide is being maintained. But on the other parts, it is not maintained. So now this is the part where I was saying you need to be careful because you need to start with where they are maintained. So we'll start with the first, first and the second one so that we try to find the order in respect to hemoglobin there. So we are going to divide that, which is 1.24 as our rate, divided by the 0 0.619 equal to the other parts. The zero where it is maintained, we won't show. Then we'll show where it is 4.42, 4.42 over 2.21. So let's resume the the power in respect to the hemoglobin is M. So get your calculator. 1.24 divided by 0 0.619. Uh, it's approximately giving me 2.003. Okay, approximately 2.003 equal to 4.42. Divided by, so I'll write that, 4.42 divided by 2.21. What do we get to have? Two point two one, Approximately 1.995, which is just a 2, the power m. And these, basically, approximately, they are just one and the same. So no need of us complicating things. We just say... Uh, our value of m is also equal to what? It's equal to 1. Okay. So we found our um, order in respect to what? To hemoglobin. So order in respect to hemoglobin is 1 there. Then order in respect to carbon monoxide. Now, that one is the one that requires you to now think critically. It would require you now to show everything. You shouldn't leave out anything. Everything is supposed to be what? Everything is supposed to be shown. Let's try to do that. So now... Instead of working with the same experiments, we're going to work with a different one. Uh, so which one should we work with? So we can work with the first and the third one. Okay. So we're going to be dividing the third one by the first one. So for the third one, we have 2.26 for the rate. Divided by the rate for the first, 0 0.619. Then that is equal to K. Of course, K will cancel out. Then the other reactant that we have is hemoglobin. So it's 3.36 divided by what? 2.21. So we found that there our power is what? Is 1. So I'll put it. Then for the other one, carbon monoxide, we don't know. So it's 2.4 divided by the 1. Rest the power which we don't know n. So get to divide 2.26 divided by 0 0.619 so i'm getting 
three point six five equal to three point three six divided by two point two one. I'm getting one point five two. Then the other part we have two point four to the power n. So three point six five divided by one point five two. I'm getting 2.40, which is just 2.4. The other side, I'm remaining with 2.4, the power n. So we've seen that the, the base is basically one and the same. So our value is also one in respect to the carbon monoxide there. OK. So that's what we're trying to say here. So basically, that's how you can go about it. So how do you get to find um, the, uh, the retro for this kind of um, the question. So the retro basically gets to focus on the idea of um, on the reactants. So in the reactants we have hemoglobin and what? And carbon monoxide. So we're just going to show their powers. In this case we've determined that the, the orders are just one. So it's just a one and a one. So this is what we call a retro. It just shows the equations that relates the rate to the reactants. So now, how do we get to find um, the value and the units for the rate constant? So I said in the previous question that all you have to do is basically get to get any experiment of your choice and plug in the information in respect to the equation. So let's get to do that. So I can go for the third experiment. The rate there was 2.26. Okay, we don't know. Hemoglobin, we had 3.36. Then for carbon monoxide, we had 2.40. So all these are raised to the power of 1. So we can just multiply 3.36, multiply by 2.40. Then uh, I'm getting. So we've multiplied the, the two. And after multiplying the two, uh, what I'm getting is, uh, so I maintain that. Then here I'm getting 8.064k. So for me to find the value of k, I need to divide. So 2.26 divided by 8.064. My value of k, therefore, is equivalent to 0 0.28025 or 26. That is of my value of what? K. Now, what order? What was the overall order of this reaction? So remember for all the reactors we had found one, so it's there for two. So therefore the unit remains remains that. Okay. So in respect to the information given in this question, we've seen that the least number of significant figures that we have is basically what? Three. So looking at that, uh, k can just be 0 0.28. Um, if we say 0 0.28, we have two. So we can just end at three. That's still fine. OK. Question five. The decomposition of hydrogen iodide at five 108 degrees Celsius at that has been given as shown. So we need to plot the concentration time graph. So we've been given the time. We've also been given the concentration. So we need to plot this on a graph. Okay. So come up with a appropriate um, appropriate scale for you to be able to to plot. So look at this. What, we, what have we been given? So for time we've been given, we have zero. So we have 50 up to 350. So we can just say 50, 100, um, 150, a 200, a 250, until it gets to 350. Then uh, for the highest value that we can look at for the concentration, it's a 0 0.1. So it's like we are starting from a higher point. So what I would advise you is to come up with, so the highest point to be a 0 
because that is like the highest value there. If you check all these others, they are less. So 0 0.1, then divide the units into 10. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Okay, let's move the 0 0.1 a bit on top. Then where it gets to end, make it 0 0.1. Meaning that this is 0 0.01. So the middle part, we want 2, 3, 4, 5. That one is 0 0.05. So that would help you. That would make your work easier. So when it comes to the protein of um, your scale, the first one is 0, 0 0.1. So it will be there. The other one is 50, 0 0.07. So 0 0.7 is going to be somewhere after 0 0.05. Somewhere there. So 1, 6. So straight is there. 100, 0 0.05. Straight to other than 0 0.05. Then for 150, somewhere 0 0.4. Straight to other than 0 0.4. 200, 0 0.03. Somewhere closer to 0 0.04, but it's lower. 250, 0 0.03. Somewhere closer to 0 0.03. So that is the way you pro you, you plot your graph and so on and so forth. That's how you get to come up with your graph. It's very, very easy. So this is basically the actual graph where it gets to use the, the actual sketching. So you've seen that it's basically coming out almost one and the same. Okay. So make sure you just come up with the right scale to help guide you. Okay. So if I was to show what I have here. So it's like, if this is up to 200 and we have four points there in between. So the middle part is 100, of course. This is a 50, that is a 150, that is a 250, 300. Okay. So now, we've plotted. Okay. Then the other question says, from the graph, calculate the average between 50 and 250 what? seconds. So we need to calculate the average watt the average rate of um, the reaction. So remember for our reaction we had uh, 2HI 2HI is equal to oh, this is a reaction let's just show it better so 2HI equal to then um, we have H2 plus I2 so this is what we have for our reaction so we need to find the rate between 50. So 50 is somewhere there. That is 50 and um, 250. 250 is after 200, so it's that point. So we need to find the rate, the average rate there. How do we get to do it? How do we get to do it there? So what we'll do first of all, let's come up with our formula for our rate, which I believe is going to be in respect to, of course, the the concentration of the reactant and of course we say it is going to be negative one over the initial or one over the stoichiometric coefficient which in this case is a two then change in concentration of the reactant over what over the change in time so if you look at the given period time there the concentration initially was at at what 50 at 250 so at 50 initially it was 0 0.07 so 0 0.0716 minus at 250 it was 0.0336. So even without the table, without the sketch, I would still come up with a solution. Change in time. 250 minus 50 is 200. Get your calculator 0 0.0716 minus 0 0.00. 0 0.0336 um, so how are we showing our calculation so basically we're supposed to show the final minus the initial so finally so it was supposed to be like the opposite there anyway so it's a final minus the initial so the final one is at 250 which is 0 0.0336 the initial one was 0 0.0716. Okay, so it will give us a negative. And what I'm getting there is um, 
I'm getting a negative 0 0.038. So this is supposed to be multiplied by negative 1 over 2 over 200. So multiply by negative 1 over 2 divided by 200. So my solution is 0 0.000095. So that is our rate. So it's smaller per second. That is how you approach that question. Then the other one says instantaneous rate at 200 seconds. So instantaneous rate, basically, we say we defined it to be the rate at a given time in the chemical reaction. So at 200 seconds, 200 seconds is there. So if you want to understand better, what you get to do is you need to come up with a, a tangent. So a tangent is like a line that cuts a curve at one point. So let's try to sketch a graph. Let's connect the points that we had. Mm, something like that. So now we're going to draw a tangent to this curve that is going to cut at 200 seconds. A tangent is a line that cuts a curve at, at a single point. So at 200, how do we do that? Let me use a different color so that we see how it's going to come out. What if I started from there? Uh, no, that's not okay. Try that. Mm, no. Mm. No. Maybe that, something like that. That's like the way you, you come up with a tangent. So now. After you come up with your tangent, so this is just rough sketching, but you need to be able to draw using your ruler a line that is cutting the curve at just that single point, a straight line. So now what you get to do is on your line, the line that you've come up with, come up with two points. Okay, Come up with two points. So in this case, I'm just going to get the point itself. The point itself where it is uh, the tangent itself. At a point where 200 is 200 comma that. Okay. Then against any other point on the line. Against any other point. So I can even consider which point. Which point can I consider there? I can consider that point. Um, the line is just too big anyway. Consider that point. If I drop it down, it's going to tell me that is slightly 350. Then, uh, if I take it this way, it's going to be so. I have one, let me count the lines that we have before the 0 0.5. So it's like we have one, two, three, four, five. So if that is 5, this is 1, 2, so that is like a second point, so it's just like 0 0.02. Then comma, this side I'm saying 350. Okay, so we've come up with two points. One we are saying the, the tangent itself, which is at uh, 200, so which is 200 comma 0 0.0387. Then the other point is 350 comma 0 0.02. Of course, that is just an approximation. So us finding the gradient of that line is going to give us what? It's going to give us instantaneous rate at that point. So the change in y over the change in x, our y, y is what? So 0 0.02, of course, modulus of it. Um, divided by the change in time, 350 minus 200 is what? That's 150. So 0 0.02 minus 0 0.0387 minus 0.0387 divided by 150. So I'm getting 0 0.00012. 
four, seven. So more like the second. So that is how you determine the instantaneous rate. You look at the what? <coughs> you look at the tangent at the given point, and then you get to get the points of your choice. Okay. Now the last one says instantaneous rate, initial instantaneous rate. So that's like at start. That's like at start. Instantaneous initial instantaneous rate. So at start, we had started at zero point with a concentration of zero point one. So that requires you to come up with um, a tangent from at that point. So a straight line, a straight line that is only going to cut drop the curve at one point. So that line obviously is supposed to be down here so that it doesn't let me use a different color so that it doesn't meet the line again. Somewhere here. Uh, somewhere. Somewhere there. Let me draw it again. Mm. Somewhere there. So that is like a line that we can draw. It can go up as well. But then we're just we're just trying to make sure that it only cuts the curve at one point. Okay. So you can get two points. So never get even the one at the end there. Because that's the one that is going to make things easier. So and the point itself. So the point itself at start was eh, zero comma zero point one. Then at the point where we've gone, so the time is somewhere this is a hundred. So somewhere a hundred straightly after and the other one is one fifty. So straightly somewhere in between there. Okay, so what would we say? We'd say that is like not so uh, 50 100 so 100 and maybe 30 comma zero that's what we have then now uh, our gradient is going to be the change in y which is 0 minus 0 0.1 then over change in time 30 130 so of course the modulus of it because we don't want to get a negative value of our rate so 0 minus 0 0.1, so 0 0.1 over 130. So remember what we have for our y, that is our concentration. For our x is a second's time. So I'm getting something like um, 0 0.00076923. Mola per second. So that's how you get to work with your graphs. A graph of time against concentration helping you to determine the rate at given times. Okay, let's look at this last question in this tutorial. So a catch of Hebrew manuscripts known as the Dead Sea Scroll was found in 1947. The specific gravity of carbon-14 in the linear lappings of a book of Isaiah was 0.2 disintegrations per second per gram. The carbon-14 living materials has, spe has a specific gravity of that. The half-life of carbon-14 is 5.73 by 10 to the power 3 years. Carbon-14 decay by first order retro. So that is a very important statement. We are told it decays by first order. Okay. So calculate the approximate age of the linen. So these are some of the questions that you don't even have to waste time on. You don't have to, under, to waste time understanding the question. Just you're trying to determine the approximate age, and you're told it's a first order. What do you get to do? So what you're going to do is you basically understand the fact that what you've been told is that it's first order. So it's a natural log of a final concentration being equal to the negative kt plus what? Natural log of initial concentration. Okay. So now, since you've been given the, um, you've been given the the half life, you're able to find what the constant scan. Remember, the half life of uh, a first order reaction is basically the natural log of two over what over k. So k is going to be what the natural log of two over what over the half life. So we're able to find that. So our goal is to find the time. 
Okay. So what are we going to have? So we have like the natural log of the final minus the natural log of the initial being equal to k, k which is the natural log of 2 over what? The half-life. So I've substituted that for k. Multiply by the t. Okay. So wha we can even plug in now. So remember what you need to understand is that disintegrations, it may be concentrations. So the final one is basically lower than the, the, the initial one. So in this case, our final one is going to be what? Our final one is going to be 0 0.2. Then our initial one is 0 0.255. Don't waste time. Don't get lost in the question. These are simple things that you just have to solve. So therefore, we have the natural log of 2. The half-life has been given to be 5.73 by 10 to the power 3. Apply by your t there. So what do you have? So I'll start with my left hand side. So um, I can divide that. 0 0.2 divided by 0 0.255. Is one way of uh, simplifying that. So I have the result that I'm getting on the left hand side is 0. negative 0 0.242946 equal to the other part. The natural log of 2 is approximately 0 0.693 divided by 5.73 by 10 to the power 3. Okay, so I'm getting something like negative. 0.00013072 t. So we can divide that into what is on the left hand side so that we get the value of the time, which is the edge. So remember our half life, we used years. So even our answer is going to be in years. So it's a t there. So the 0 0.242 9 four six on the left divided by what is on our right attached to the T. So I'm going to do that again. So remember on the left hand side we had the natural log of 0 0.2 minus the natural log of what? 0 0.255. Equal to the other part what do we have? So we had something like minus KT. So let me try to redo that again. So I'll calculate my k separately. Remember we said our k is going to be the, the natural log of 2 over the half-life, which is 5.73 by 10 to the power 3. So 5.73 by 10 to the power 3, then divide that into the natural log of 2. OK. So I'm getting something like um, 0 0.00120968. That is for my value of k. So I'll divide that into what is on the left. So then on the left, what am I getting? It's the natural log of 2 minus the natural log of 0 0.255. Okay. So I'm getting um, a two point. What I'm getting two point zero five nine six equal to. Then on the right hand side, remember for our k, what have we found? We found the one that is I've shown on top here. Yeah? So it's zero point zero 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 one two zero nine six eight. So negative. Is it negative? And what did, how did I just do my calculations? So that is your t. Then, um, so on the left hand side, the calculation was not okay. It's a natural log of 0 0.2 minus a natural log of 0 0.255. So natural log of 0 0.2 minus natural log of 0 0.255, which is a negative value. 
negative 0 0.242946. That divided by negative 0 0.000 one two zero nine six eight. So the answer I'm getting is two thousand and eight point four years. So that is how you go about your calculations. So understand when they tell you the order. It's very very important that you understand the rate laws, the integrated rate laws that you work with, and also the formulas for the half lives. And also generally understand that decay is basically a first order reaction, whether stated or not stated. So that's it for this video. Watch out for the next video that is going to focus more on other kinetics questions, especially to deal with the activation energy and the Arrhenius equation.